Hi, welcome to Daily Literature Series. Today we will discuss G.M. Hopkins. G.M. Hopkins is one of the eminent Victorian poets and he was a Jesuit Catholic priest also. He was raised from a large artistic family and he showed his talents in music, drawing, poetry and he was known as a socialite. He was the center of attraction in his school and or among his friends because he wrote prolifically at that time and he showed interest in literature as well. A short description on his life. He was born in 1844 and he died in 1899 and uh, in 1866 he converted to Catholic Church because he was born in, born as a Anglo Christian and uh, he later converted to Catholicism because of his uh, interest towards Catholic values and motives. In six, 1868 he joined Jesuit order uh, to become a Catholic priest and when he became a priest he burned all of his poems and he did not write again for many years. When he became a priest he burned all of his poems and he did not write again for many years because he believed that uh, poetry writing or enjoying writing poetry is totally against his vows that he took uh, at the time of ordination. So he believed that or he took the position that poetry writing needs self-indulgence, self-satisfaction, self-pleasures. So it's actually against the vows he has taken at the time of his ordination and his priesthood. And 1875 he uh, returned to poetry and he wrote The Rock of Duschland, a major work in his life and, and the first work after his uh, ordination as a priest. His last poems included terrible poems. At the end of his career he, he was just like um, he believed in God but he, he was of complaint that God has been not answering his questions. Uh, he has been, God has been abandoned, God has abandoned him. So that was his uh, content of poems uh, in the terrible poems. He died in Dublin in 1889 and he was, his poetry was not published until 1918 by Robert Bridges, the poet laureate and his friend. So his poetical styles. As we said, uh, he was a Victorian poet, but he was not included in the Victorian style of poetry because uh, his style of poetry, uh, his poetical styles, forms, uh, all those things were radically different from that of his contemporaries like Matthew Arnold, D.G. Rossetti, uh, Robert Browning, Elizabeth Barrett Browning. So all these people uh, wrote poem in the Victorian style, the so-called Victorian uh, poetics. But there are, he wrote, he wrote poems of his own style. He used his own um, rhythm, his own meter, his own styles. So he was not included in the Victorian line of poets. He used intense experiences and he used and he invented sprung rhythm, a rhythm uh, which is asymmetrical and which uses uh, stressed syllables followed by vary, varying unstressed syllables which gives an intense experience of the poem. And he used inscape and instress. He believed in the uh, uniqueness of each and everything and he tried to to manifest uh, its individuality through his poems or the images he used and God's grandeur. So he believed in the God's creation, God's power and uh, the omnipresence of God in the nature, the omniscient nature of God. Since he is a spiritual man, he believed that uh, writing poetry is against his intention of vows. He took vows and he believed that um, writing poetry 
that is totally against his uh, priesthood because he he thought that poetry involved or poetry demands much self indulgence and pleasures so all those self indulgence and pleasures were uh, against the vows as he considered and we come to his one of the most important contributions that is sprung rhythm so sprung rhythm as we know it's a complex system of metrics is a complex system it's not an easy one it is against it is counter to what we specifically specifically call running rhythm or common rhythm because it is asymmetrical in style in, in its form it's asymmetrical so it's it's so complex and this rhythm is based on the metrical systems of anglo-saxon and traditional welsh poetry it's true that he was influenced by why he spent spent some of his years in uh, dublin and he came to contact with welsh poetry and he was to- in- moved by the styles of anglo-saxon uh, poetry and uh, traditional welsh poetry that led him to invent a new style sprung rhythm it is a meter in which each foot having one stressed syllable followed by a varying number of unstressed ones so it's so uh, complex one stressed syllable syllable is followed by varying numbers of syllables so it's not in a regular way it's not a common uh, running form or rhythm we we have it's asymmetrical for example in pied beauty we see the first line glory be to god for dappled things this is sprung rhythm is asymmetrical stress stress the syllable is followed by varying number of unstressed syllables so he called it a sprung rhythm his next contribution is inscape and instress by inscape he means the unified complex of characteristics that give each thing its uniqueness and that differentiate uh, it from other things so it's a it's the uniqueness of a thing it's the particularity of a thing so that which make uh, something different from another thing so he means it by inscape he means the uniqueness the thingness of a thing and the uniqueness of a thing so everything every object everything in the world in the nature is uh, is unique and it has its own specifications and it is totally different from all other things so he was actually influenced and moved by duns scotus a catholic theologian and philosopher who lived in 13th century and he believed that only individual and particular things in this world can be known directly by human beings so only only particular things and individual things unique things can be known and can be um, understood by the human beings so that led him to um, to have more research on the uniqueness of a thing particularity of a thing or the thingness of an object and uh, he believes that inscape is the soul and spirit of a thing it is the inscape that is that makes uh, a thing worth and it makes a thing meaningful an object meaningful so that is the uniqueness that is the soul and spirit according to w h gardner it is the name for the individually distinctive form of a thing so this is very this is totally different if you if you take 100 trees or 100 buildings each one is totally different from other things in its style in its, in its color uh, in its form uh, so there are different matters different styles different specifications uh, which make one different from other things and so it is the outward reflection of the inward nature of a thing familiar to wordsworth's spots of time emerson's moments and james joyce's epiphanies so 
Wordsworth Wordsworth spoke of sports of time by sports of time he understood that and he used in his poetry uh, certain imageries which carries the past moments the myths or the temporal flow of uh, past so the pastness the time all those things are considered as sports of time he used such imageries from the nature to depict uh, his own ideas of or his own uh, imaginations of myth or the memories of the past and emerson's ralph waldo emerson's specific or brief moments he believed that particular uh, experiences unique experiences of nature are brief moments that are important that are unique and that are uh, brief moments and james joy's epiphanies so sudden experience sudden manifestation of a thing otherwise uh, which can be understood as uh, a normal thing so it's a sudden manifestation it's a new revelation of a thing so that is a unique thing so uh, inscape is familiar to or it resembles resembles uh words were sports of time emerson's moments and uh, uh, james joe's epiphanies by instress he means the actual experience of a reader uh, that of inscape so the actual experience of reader of an inscape in an imagery so this is the actual experience the actual manifestation of the inscape it is received into the sight memory and imagination the poet's job is to find images that will nail the inscape down for readers so in order to understand the uniqueness of thing you should uh, you should ha- use the instress so the experience of the uniqueness of a thing or the way you experience the way you understand or the way you uh, get the meaning of the uniqueness or the inscape that is called instress so the way inscape is manifested we call it instress his another important contribution is kertel sonnets he discovered a new kind of sonnets and it is called as kertel sonnets and he considered this poem pied beauty as a kertel sonnets it means a shortened and a contracted sonnet it's not a traditional uh, sonnet we don't find the traditional uh, patterns traditional styles but it's a miniature it's a trad- it's a miniature or shortened form of traditional sonnets in traditional sonnets as we know in shakespeare or in spenserian uh, in uh, petrarchan sonnets we have 14 lines but it consists of 11 lines he shortened in into 11 lines and he reduced octave eight lines to uh, sesset six lines and the second session six lines sesset to four and half lines so altogether we have 11 verses 10 and actually 10 and half verses the first stanza is the sesset and the second stanza is the quintain so six and four and half so 10 and 1/2 the rhyme scheme is a b c a b c his last poems are known as terrible sonnets terrible sonnets or sonnets of desolation he named it as terrible or desolation poems because of uh, because of the pessimism he experienced or the depression he had because of the feeling that god has abandoned him so in this poem he questioned god and his providence he doubted the providence of god because he found many of his questions were unanswered he was a firm devotee he was so spiritual and he uh, he found that he was un- unanswered by god his main works are the wreck of the dushland been see populars pied beauty the windover to christ our lord the wreck of the dushland which was written in 1875 the wreck of the dushland is actually based on 
a real incident that happened in 1875 a scottish made passenger vessel which was drowned in 1875 the victims included five franciscan nuns from westphalia germany when bismarck of prussia implemented fuck laws uh, these people were cast out by the law and they were traveling from germany to new to new york and he used sprung rhythm first time in this poem and it became a regular poetic form in his poetry and first actually the poem was rejected by the magazine the month the month is a magazine by jesuit order and uh, and the authority found that this poem is too hard to grasp to understand its use of uh, complex imagery and intense use of experience and new rhythm uh, they found it difficult to understand even the robert bridges his friend nobel laureate sorry uh, poet laureate discouraged him from publishing it and even he denied to read it again in this poem he uses biblical allusions to lay down the circumstances of accident and tragic experiences of the victims pied beauty a poem written in 1877 it is known as a kirtle sonnet a kirtle sonnet as we know it's a shortened sonnet it's a miniature form of the original sonnets or original sonnets of shakespearean or petrarca it has 10 and a half lines it is the beginning line is an offering to God. It's, he praises God. Glory be to God for the dappled things. Dappled things means multicolored, strange, uh, unique things in this world. The next five lines are depict, uh, depicted in a way it qualifies the given examples. The given Im- images are uh, analyzed and uh, the beauty of God the multicoloredness of the world is uh, implemented. At then poet says God must be praised because of his dappled uh, creation. The whole world is a dappled creation. The world, world, the whole world is multicolored. The whole world is uh, beautiful because God has created it in a such a way that everything has its own individuality. Everything has its own particularity and uniqueness. Next poem is Windover. It is written in 1877. It's a sonnet and it is dedicated to Christ our Lord. Windover to Christ our Lord. The name refers to the bird's ability to hover in mid-air while haunting prey. So Windover. So it's a, it, the title indicates the ability of the bird to hover on the air to hover in the mid-air while hounding the prey, while searching for the uh, prey in, on ground. So this particular bird, it has a peculiar ability to hover on the air and scan the ground in order to find the prey. So it hovers in the air, suggesting that it controls the wind as a man may control a horse. So this imagery, the hovering bird on the air suggests a suggests or it uh, resembles a, an image that a man controls a horse so it's same way uh, the same way man controls a horse the bird controls the air the bird can be viewed as a metaphor of christ or a divine ep- epiphany divine epiphany or it is a metaphor for Christ, the risen Christ. So as we know the epiphany, the manifestation, the sudden manifestation of a thing. So a thing, a usual thing is manifested in an unusual way, that is epiphany. James Joyce uses the epiphany. So the hovering bird can be viewed as a metaphor for or a, a metaphor for Christ. The poem's octave, the first eight lines, concentrates primarily on the bird, on the bird, its qualifications. The sesset discusses the creature 
ഇൻ എ വൈഡർ റിലീജിയസ് കോണ്ടക്സ്റ്റ് ബിൻസി പോപ്പുലേഴ്സ് ഇറ്റ് വാസ് റിട്ടൺ ഇൻ എയ്റ്റീൻ സെവൻറ്റീൻ നയൻ ഇറ്റ്സ് ആക്ച്വലി എ ഡിർജ് അനലജി ഓൺ ലാൻഡ്സ്കേപ്പ് വിച്ച് ഹി ആഡ് നോൺ ഇൻറ്റിമേറ്റ്ലി വൈൽ സ്റ്റഡിങ് അറ്റ് ഓക്സ്ഫോർഡ് ആക്ച്വലി ബിൻസി ബിൻസി മീൻസ് എ ഹിൽ ഓൺ ദ നോർത്തൻ എഡ്ജ് ഓഫ് ദ ലേക്ക് ഡിസ്ട്രിക്ട് ഇൻ കുംബ്രിയ ഇംഗ്ലണ്ട് സോ ഇറ്റ്സ് എ പ്ലേസ് ഇൻ ഇംഗ്ലണ്ട് ഇറ്റ്സ് എ ഡിസ്ട്രിക്ട് കുംബ്രിയ ഇസ് ആൻ is a district in England and uh, the hilly places of Cumbria is known as Binsi and poplars. Poplar is a tall fast growing tree of northern temperate regions. It's a tree, it's a tall it's fast growing uh, tree in northern temperate regions and it is used for timber and pulp and it's, it is also known as aspen trees. Aspen. So, Binsi poplars, poplars in Binsi region, Binsi hilly place, uh, poplars, uh, aspen trees in Binsi or in the hilly places in Cumbria. So it's an elegy, elegy on uh, the motives of people of cutting down the Binsi poplars in that region. So people are not at all dependent of what they are doing. so the poet mourns the cutting of his aspen trees aspen deer he calls aspen's deer and uh, he is so saddened by uh, the images of cutting down of uh, binsi poplars its beauty resided not only in their appearance but in the way they created airy cages to tame the sunset sunlight the people fail to realize the implications of their actions so the poet is so depressed the poet poet questions the motives of uh, those people who cuts down um, the binsi poplars so they don't know they don't realize or they are not at all dependent of what they are doing they don't know the implications of cutting down or felling all the trees all the aspen trees so he it's an elegy elegy on the place a particular place and on cutting down the trees binsi poplars so this and this is a poem which is written in sprung rhythm and it's it is an elegy 